welcome to the Story Ninja Studio. And if it isn't clear enough, right, you can see it. Let me see right there. Welcome to the Story Ninja Studio on my amazingly large whiteboard. You can see the It Rocks to be a Story Ninja logo everywhere. You can see it on my t-shirt. Uh, I'm Sigmund Brower, and I'm an author for Tundra Books. And, uh, but I also want to be a Story Ninja. And I think it'd be fun if you decided you were a story ninja. We connect through stories from movies, telling stories, reading stories delivered by books. I, when I tell people I don't read books, they're like, what? I say, I read stories. It's all about story. So Sigmund Brower, author of Clan, Innocent Heroes. And I know you can see that right now over my shoulder. And I just want to say hi and, and welcome to our time today where I, where, where I get to talk about clan. A new story called Clan. And I also have a copy right here. And I thought I would introduce um, Atlanta to you by reading the opening, opening few pages. So for some context, this is set roughly 14,000 years ago. And it takes place in North America, the Western half of North America. And if you can picture the Canadian US border on a map, imagine this, at that time, coast to coast, Canada was covered with ice, a kilometer to two kilometers thick. It's really difficult to imagine that, isn't it? If you can, if you can picture this, only the tips of the Rocky Mountains stuck up out of the ice. There was so much ice, it drew water from the oceans, and the shoreline was 60, uh, 60 miles, 100 kilometers farther out. So right now, if you were in, in BC, standing on the coast, 14,000 years ago, that coastline would have been 100 kilometers farther out. South of the ice, well, there lived I'm not even gonna tell you right now. I'm gonna start reading to you. Page one, chapter one, clan. At Laddle's first warning of the saber tooth was a snarl that echoed down the stone walls on each side of them. At Laddle world during, at Laddle world toward the sound of the snarl and froze at the sight of the horrible beast, saber tooth. It was the distance of a throw of a spear away. At Laddle, did not have his spear. He'd set it against a tree just down the hill. At this distance, a spear would have not helped anyway. Ever since a childhood stumbled down a cliff, at Laddle's left leg was permanently twisted at the knee. He was unable to put weight on it to throw with any strength. The saber tooth snarled again, took another step. Even if he was capable of running, which, because of his knee, he was not, Atlatl was trapped by rock walls. This beast, then, was in no hurry. Sabertooths were heavy and broad, low to the ground, shoulders wide. Sabertooths did not chase with a burst of speed like a cheetah. Sabertooths needed to pounce from ambush, then sink the spears of their front teeth into the necks of startled victims or into the soft bellies of larger play, prey like mammoth or camel. Its orange-brown fur rippled as it lifted and set down each of its massive paws. Too soon it would be close enough for a ferocious leap with terrifying jaws opened wide. I'm not worth your effort, Atlatl told the saber tooth. He'd needed to swallow a few times just to work moisture into his mouth. I'm skinny. My bones will get stuck in your throat and choke you. It was either force himself to speak in a calm manner that hid his terror, or shriek and limp away as fast as possible. He really wanted to shriek and run. He knew, however, that movement would make the saber tooth chase and pounce. Life, both as hunters and hunted, taught children the ways of survival early. Those who paid the price for inattention, if their bodies could re be retrieved, were wrapped in animal skins and returned to the earth beneath the tears of the women of the clan, who would sing wordless tunes of mourning until the sun left the sky, their faces painted red with ochre. Stories of the person would be told around the fires so no one would forget them. What Atlantle wanted to do was most was listen to the tremble in his belly and flee, 
knowing that any second those great claws would dig deep into the flesh of his shoulders and back, but he refused to allow himself to die with those marks. If his body was ever found, he did not want anyone in the clan to know he'd been a coward, especially Taki, beautiful Taki. He wanted her to cry over his death, not be ashamed of him. After all, he was up in these hills hunting birds to bring her back a gift of bright feathers. Go away, Atlatl told the saber tooth. I'm a shaman. I'm a medicine man. I can cast a spell on you. I will turn you into a mouse and squeeze you until your eyes pop out. It was an idle threat. Atlatl was not the clan shaman. That honor belonged to Banty, Atlatl's uncle. Atlatl was just a boy, almost a man, with a twisted left leg. I saw a giant sloth. Atlatl said to the saber tooth, a little ways down the hill, much bigger than me. You can take your time. It'll still be there. You do know sloths move slowly. Yes? The beast ignored Atlatl's promise of a giant sloth and continued to creep forward. Too soon it would be close enough for a ferocious leap with terrifying jaws open wide. Atlatl knew he'd been careless and doubted he'd survive to learn from his mistake. Well, that's the beginning of clan. I have it here. You can see it behind me. Um, and I hope it hooked you enough to want to read on. As you can guess, Atlatl survives. I think the big question that I hope is in your mind is, how does he, how does he survive and what happens next? And I think that's the power of story for any story you're going to read, wondering what's going to happen next. If you're wondering why I wanted to write that story, first of all, for all of us, humans are driven by stories. Don't we, when we meet people, don't we tell each other stories? Don't we listen to stories? Don't we love watching? Have I made my point? Oh, right, we're in the Story Ninja studio. And I started wondering what it would be like to live in the Ice Age. I, I, I wondered what it would be like if your life depended on your intelligence and how you could form tools out of what's available in front of you. And I think it's a huge mistake to think of, to think of uh, our ancestors 14 or 15,000 years ago as, as not intelligent at all because they lived in the stone age. In fact, um, if, if we had, if Atlatl stepped into the room right now, you wouldn't see any difference between Atlatl and, and anyone else. The big difference is we could put you and Atlatl in the wilderness and he'd be having a much easier time than you would. But the flip side is if you threw Atlatl in front of a computer, he'd be like, what's going on? It's just all about the tools that we learned. So I started thinking about tools and what it'd be like to survive. And, and all you have is a pouch and you know how to make a fire and you know how to chip stones. But not every stone is suitable for a tool. You know exactly what kind of rock, how to chip it. And by the way, their spear points are razor sharp. Sharper than the sharper scalpel a surgeon can have today. The difference is their edges wear down quickly. So then I got excited about doing my research. How do you make tools? How do you work them? What kind of animals were around? Mammoths, you know that. Um, cheetahs, camels, and of course, saber tooths. But as an aside, beavers were the size of bears. They called it an era of megafauna. So now I started doing my research, what would it be like to live there? Because isn't story all about daydreaming? And for a moment, if you want to imagine what it'd be like if you were there, it's a fun daydream. But then, do you see me pointing at you? I discovered the greatest floods in, in the history of the earth hit during that time. Are you curious yet? So imagine you've got the border between the US and Canada and ice is all across Canada. And you know, some of it came down to the United States. There was one river that would get dammed by the ice. And as the ice built, it would form a lake behind it. Google it, it's called Lake Missoula. Does not exist anymore because the ice isn't here. But what would happen? Lake Missoula would be the size of one of our great lakes and the water would rise so high that the pressure of the water 
would eventually change the temperature at the bottom and it would start to eat away at the bottom of the ice dam. And you can guess what happened next. At one point it would burst open and Eastern Washington State has these riverbeds that for decades people could understand why they were so weird, why they were so deep. And if you can imagine the Amazon River, one of the biggest rivers in the world, multiply that by 10, put it behind a dam, let it go and have water rushing at you at about 140 kilometers an hour, let's say 85 miles an hour. Uh, we're talking cubic square miles of water pounding through the land. And you look up and you see that water headed toward you. What would that be like? Now, when you combine a flood and a saber tooth cub and a kid who, whose leg is, is permanently twisted, there's one last little thing. You sure you wanna know? <laughs> Have you ever seen that, that movie, Night at the Museum? That's the Natural History Museum in New York City. If you're ever there, go. It's cool in the movie, it's cooler in real life. I visited that to learn more about the Ice Age. I saw the skeletons of saber tooths. They're massive. And I also saw a weapon. And all I'm going to tell you is this weapon is called an atlatl. So that's the only spoiler I'm gonna give you. We start with a character named atlatl, and by the end of the story, you learn about the weapon that he made that in my fiction, I decided they named it in honor of the boy who invented it. That's all I'm going to give you. I, I don't want to forget to mention that there's a really cool educator's guide that goes with it. And I'm happy to tell you it's really cool because I did not write the educator's guide. We had a teacher write it and she was amazing and it's a really fun way to learn more about the story, to learn more about the background. And there are a couple of activities in there. Well, there's lots of activities. Two, two of them are, are kind of my favorite. One is this, read the story. Notice I didn't say read the book. A book's just a delivery system for story. Read the story and then do an interview with Atlanta. You could do it on paper, right? You could write your question down and then have it lateral answer. But why wouldn't you do it on video, right? You, this is what I'd do if I were you. I would film my interview questions and then I would dress up like at lateral and pretend I was at lateral and then I'd answer the questions that, that I asked myself and then put them together because most of you already know how to do iMovie and stuff like that. So do the interview either uh, video or on paper. Or uh, the other thing is make a book trailer. Add some cool music, get, get, get uh, copyright free images of a saber tooth, you know, flushing, flashing, all that stuff. I think it'd be really fun to put a book trailer together. So look at the educator's guide and, and um, I hope you discover it's, it, that you agree with me that it's a lot of fun. I would love to do a virtual author visit at your school. Uh, and I, t I talk about the power story. I'm not gonna tell you what it's about. I'm just gonna tell you it involves video, music. Everybody in the audience gets a free ebook as a thank you for attending. So I love doing virtual visits. And if you're at all interested, I'm doing something really, really fun for me at least. I have an online well, I'm an online teacher. So if your school is interested, they can sign up and every Monday and Wednesday of every week of the school year, you and your classmates or you and your teacher come and hang out with me and I teach a writing course based on curriculum and I do my best to make it fun. So you could join me in a one-time virtual author visit or I could be your writing teacher for the entire school year. Um, just contact me at storyninjasrock at icloud.com and I'll be happy to send you any information you like. And lastly, I have a fun book club called www.storyninjabookclub.com and you can join that and get a whole bunch of free ebooks and a whole bunch of videos to watch and then just another way to contact me.
So everyone, thanks for hanging out with me for, for a while. And I just want to remind you, I'm Sigmund Brower, author of Clan. And if you like Clan, do you see over, oops, you see over this shoulder, Innocent Heroes, also by, by Tundra Books. It has great stories from real life about how animals rescued soldiers uh, during World War I. So I would love it if you checked out either of those books. Thanks a lot and goodbye.